Hello everyone, welcome back to this channel. In this video, we're going to look into chapter 12 of A-level physics, wave phenomenal. And these are the topics that we're going to cover. Feel free to skip over if you're only interested in a certain topic. Without further ado, let's move on. So the first thing that we're going to look at today is the term called progressive wave. This wave is a wave that moves energy from one place to, for example, a primary seismic or secondary seismic wave, which is the type of wave that is transferred during an earthquake. Now, something that you need to know about wave is that it's not something tangible. It is a pattern of movement or vibration that transfer energy. So I have included an image of people doing the wave pattern in a stadium. So the concept is very similar. The wave is not actually a thing that you can touch but it is a pattern that you know everyone is just doing and when they do it together it becomes a wave so when we talk about wave we are really describing how energy flows and affects things around it and not a tangible thing itself some example of wave would be a light wave something that we see every day it travels from the sun to the earth in the form of a sound wave and also a water wave so when you throw a pebble into the pond the ripple that spread out are the water wave. So here are a few terms that you need to know about wave as well. It will help you to understand the topics that we're going to cover in the following subchapter. So first thing, amplitude, the maximum height of a wave from its rest position, showing how strong the wave is. So a light that has a high amplitude will have higher intensity. A sound that has high amplitude would have a louder voice, etc. And the second term you need to know is wavelength. It is the distance between two matching points on a wave, like crest to crest. It can also be the distance between the trough to the trough. Another thing, displacement, is how far a point on the wave is from at rest at any position. So unlike amplitude, it is not the maximum distance. So if you were to switch the graph a little bit to make the x exist to be time, then we got another two terms. The first term is period. How long does it take for a complete wave to pass through a point? Second one is frequency. They are interrelated in a while. I will show you how. But frequency tells you that how many waves pass through a certain point in one second. So if I were to change this into one, then you can see that this graph actually have a frequency of two because two complete waves has passed through a certain point in one second. The wave that we have been exploring so far, some of them, they are mechanical wave. They require a medium to be trans. So for example, sound wave and water wave, they all require a medium. Unlike light, light is not a mechanical wave because it doesn't require a medium to travel through. So we're gonna look into a device that helps us to visualize wave better. As I said, it's intangible, but how do we analyze that? So an equipment that people always use is oscilloscope and they provide a CRO trace. And this is how it looks like. So this is a work example. Let's try to solve it. On a CRO with a time base of five milliseconds per div, per div means one box and Y gains of 200 millivolt per diff. Calculate the frequency and amplitude of the wave. All right, let's try to find out the frequency of this graph. We know that frequency can be calculated using one over period, and period is the amount of time for one wave to pass through. Frequency is how many waves pass through in one second. So we can do that one second divided by period. And from this graph, we can know the period, how long it takes for one wave to pass through. So we can see that the distance between this point and this point, one complete wave, is 12.5 diff. And one diff is equal to 5 milliseconds on a time base. So the period will be 12.5 multiplied by 5. So we can just put everything into the formula and we will have gotten the frequency, which is 16 hertz. The amplitude is even simple. We just have to pick the center of the graph and then calculate the amount of diff here multiplied by how much voltage per diff so we got 5 times 200 millivolt and we got 1000 millivolt which is equal to 1 volt so that's the amplitude of the wave so we now look into the different types of wave longitudinal wave and transverse wave so let's read the definition and i'm gonna explain it a longitudinal wave is a wave where particles vibrate parallel to the direction of wave velocity so what does it mean so if you can see from this spring here the hand is moving from left to right, left to right, left to right. And the movement of the spring is also from left to right. That's why they said a longitudinal wave is a wave where particle vibrate parallel, in parallel to whatever direction the movement of the hand is. Whereas transverse is the opposite. In transverse wave, the hand is going to move up and down, up and down, up and down. But 
the wave is going to transfer energy from left to right. That's why the definition states that a transverse wave is a wave where particles vibrate perpendicular, which is 90 degree, to the direction of the wave velocity. And that's the difference between longitudinal and transverse wave. So a closer look into how longitudinal wave, for example, look like in a sound wave. They have two parts. The compression part, where particles are close together, and the rarefaction parts, where the particles are further apart. And a sound wave is an example of a longitudinal wave. Whereas transverse wave is something we talk about. The particles vibrate perpendicular to the direction of the wave, forming peak and trough. An example of it would be a like wave. Now let's look into the concept of phase difference. So in short, what it means is how far one point is ahead or behind the other point in terms of their position in the wave cycle. So let me explain. So this is the formula that you can use to calculate wave difference. So first you need to figure out what's the wavelength and how far two points are away from each other in a wave cycle. Multiply by 300. And let's solve an example. For example, point 0.1 and point 0.2, that is then is 3 cm. The wavelength is 5 cm. We can just do 3 over 5 multiply by 360. And then we would have gotten the phase difference. And we say that two particles are traveling in step if they oscillate synchronously, reaching their maximum and minimum position at the same time. So for example, you can see the purple color dot here and the blue color dot here, they are two paths. You can see that the purple color dots arrive at the minimum position at the same time. Same goes to blue dots. So particle oscillating in steps have a phase difference that is of a multiple of two pi radian which is 360 degree, either 0 degree, 360 degree, and it indicates that they're perfectly synchronized. Whereas, particles who are traveling in antiphase looks like this. When one point is at its minimum, the other point will be at maximum and vice versa. So as they travel, the so green reaches the maximum, or reaches the minimum. And this is when we say that two particles are traveling in antiphase. So particles who are traveling in antiphase, the radian, the phase difference will be 180, or it can also be 270. Alright, now let's look into how energy can be transferred through wave. We have water wave and sound wave. As energy is transferred, the particles will not move and stay its place. Now to understand how energy transfer works, we have to understand the concept of intensity. It is the amount of energy transmitted per unit area. It's a little bit like pressure. Pressure is force over area, but this one is energy over area and the formula to calculate that would be power divided by area and that's the unit and I'm gonna show you how to solve a work example. Say the intensity is 120 kilowatt per meter square. If the wave cover an area of this, how much energy is transferred? So intensity is given, area is given, so we just have to calculate the power and then we will have gotten the power 360 watts. But that's not the energy transfer. So we have to transfer this into joule per second, which is the definition of power actually, how much energy is transferred per second. So that's the answer that I'm going to write in my exam. All right, now let's look into another work example that involves calculating the intensity, which is slightly more complicated. A 150 watt speaker emits sound uniformly in all directions. Assuming that the speaker to be as point sparse, calculate the intensity of the sound at a distance of 2 meters. It might be tempting to put 2 meter under this area quantity, but what we want is area, but not the distance. So this is why you have to consider that the area of the wave transfer will be like a sphere, not a circle. And the 2 meter here will be the radius of the sphere. So to calculate the area of a sphere, this is the formula. And all we need to do is just put everything into the formula. 0.15 because I'm converting 150 into kilowatt divided by 4 pi r squared. And this would be the answer that, which is the intensity of the sound wave. Now the intensity of a wave decreases as it travels because energy is spread over a larger area. So for example, if say we want to calculate the intensity of sound at four meter away from the speaker, that would be lower, which is common sense as well. But if you want to look at the equation, the greater the denominator here, the lower the intensity. And that's explain why the intensity is affected in this case. So intensity, is also proportional to the square of the amplitude expressed mathematically i proportional to a square. So if a wave amplitude is doubled, then the intensity will be increased by the factor of 4. So let's solve an example. A wave has an amplitude of 3 meter and an intensity of this amount. If the amplitude is increased to 6, what will be the intensity of the wave? So we already know that if amplitude is increased by 2 times, 
then the intensity will be increased by 4 times. That's why the new intensity will be 9 times 4. The way I would do it, because i is equal to a squared, um, that's why I'm gonna do 3 power of 2, 9, 6 power of 2, 36. That will be simple. Alright, now let's look into the speed of wave. It is the rate at which the wave propagates through a medium calculated by the product of frequency times lambda. So the typical speed for sound is 330, like is 3 times 10 to the power of 8. And I want to show you how we can derive the speed of wave formula. So assuming I have this water wave and the wavelength is 5 meter, alright? And we know that frequency is the number of complete waves that pass through a given point per unit time. So for example, if my frequency is 3 hertz, it means 3 complete waves pass through point A at 1 second. And to calculate the speed of wave, we know that the speed of wave is how much distance it travel in 1 second. And because of that, we can use the frequency, which is how many complete waves in 1 second, multiplied by how long is one complete wave. And when we do that, we would have gotten the speed of wave. So for example, if the frequency is 3 and the wavelength is 5, and we know that 3 complete waves pass through A in 1 second, so it means it travel 50 meter per second. And that is when we have the speed. 50 meter per second is the speed of the wave. And according to the speed formula, if the speed of the wave is constant, then the value of frequency is inversely proportional to the length. If it increases, then the wavelength will be decreased. So let's have a work example. This water wave has a frequency of 5 hertz, 5 complete wave in 1 second, and the wavelength is 2 meters. So the speed of wave, we can just multiply them together, which is 10 meter per second. All right, now let's look into another wave phenomenon called the Doppler effect. This is going to be slightly complicated, but I'm going to make it simple for you. It is the change in frequency or wavelength of... Well, we can see from this diagram that if the moving source is moving closer to the object, then the pitch rises as sound wave compress and frequency increase. Because as you, as you can see here, the wavelength decreases. And when the sound source move away, the pitch lowers and the stretch sound wave and decreased frequency. And it turns out that physicists has come up with an equation to calculate the observed frequency depending on the speed at which the source is moving relative to the observer. So we have this equation and in the next one minute, I'm going to explain how we can derive it. So let's understand the quantity first. Fs is the frequency of the wave emitted by the source the original source, the speed of the wave emitted by the source, and lambda O is the observed wavelength, it will never change. And what we want to do is calculate what's the frequency of the wave perceived by this object depending on how fast they are moving away or closer to us. So which is why we have also the speed at which the source is moving relative to the observer. I'm going to break down the equation one by one. So frequency of the wave, this is it, speed of the wave V. And with these two quantities, we will have gotten the wavelength using the V equal to F times lambda formula. So this is my wavelength formula. Well, things got a bit different if the source is moving away from the observer. As you can see from this graph, this is the speed at which the observer is moving away. So with that, we'll know that the observed wavelength will be slightly different again, V plus Vs instead of just the V. And then to find the observed frequency, we know that frequency can be calculated using F equal to V divided by lambda O. And that's the equation that we have derived for lambda O, observed wavelength. So we just substitute everything into the formula, and then we have gotten this formula to calculate the observed frequency. Whereas if the object is moving closer to another object, then instead of adding the speed at which the source is moving relative to the observer, we minus it. And then the equation will look like that. Well, this is the conclusion that the formula that we found so depending on whether the sound source is moving away or closer to the object, then we'll decide whether to use plus or minus. So to help you understand better, let's try to solve it. A car honking is horn at a frequency of 500 is moving towards a stationary observer at a speed of 20. And the speed of sound is this. What frequency does the observer hear? And because the car is going towards the observer, we're using, we are using the minus, all right? And we just substitute everything into it and we would have found the frequency. So from the answer, you can see when the sound source is moving towards the observer, the observed frequency is actually higher than the original frequency. So that's something about Doppler effect that you can know. Well, now let's look into electromagnetic wave, which is a combination of electricity and magnetism. So in 8030, just some history, Michael Faraday discovered that a changing magnetic field 
induces electric current. You can see from this circuit, there's no battery. The current is induced. And this breakthrough link electricity and magnetism, laying the foundation for electromagnetic theory. And then another physicist, Maxwell, published in 1865, it shows that oscillating magnetic and electric wave can propagate as a transverse wave through space, moving at the speed of light. Basically, light is actually an electromagnetic wave, and this unifies electricity and magnetism as light wave. And last one, Abdul Salam, they shows that electromagnetic and weak nuclear forces are two aspects of a single electroweak force. Of course, we, we're not going to delve deep into this, but what I'm trying to show here is just the relationship between electricity and magnetism, which result in electromagnetic wave. So we know that every charged particle here, positive or negative, they have an electric field. And then when these charged particles move, it also creates magnetic field. In other words, we have a combination of electric and magnetic field. And when this happens, this is when we have electromagnetic wave. So in an electromagnetic wave, the electric and magnetic field oscillate perpendicular to each other. And this oscillation helps them to propagate through the space. And with the electromagnetic wave, I'm now going to introduce the electromagnetic spectrum. And depending on the frequency and the wavelength, we're going to produce different electromagnetic wave. So in the electromagnetic spectrum, we have gamma ray, x-ray, visible light, ultraviolet, infrared, microwave, radio wave. They are different in terms of their wavelength and frequency. But if you look at this spectrum here, the spectrum is continuous. There's no sharp boundary. You can see gamma ray and x-ray, they all overlap with each other. Uh, same goes to microwave and infrared because each type actually smoothly transition into the next one. So x-ray and gamma ray, you can see it's, they often overlap. So their classification usually based more on the origin where or how we created the wave rather than the distinct physical property like wavelength and frequency. The last topic of the day is polarization. It refers to the direction of a wave vibration and it applies only to transverse wave. So this is how unpolarized wave look like. They vibrate in multiple direction, but polarization restrict this vibration to only one direction. And let me show you visually how it works. So, so an unpolarized wave will be plain polarized when it vibrate in just one direction like that. And this light can be plain pa passing through a polarizing filter, which blocks all vibration except those aligned with the filter orientation. So you can see from this diagram here, only the pink color arrow gets to go through because it is at the same orientation of the polarizing filter. This is an example of how light wave can be polarized. So if it encounters a horizontal filter afterward, it is blocked due to misalignment of vibration. I do not have the equipment with me, but feel free to just look up YouTube and they will show you how it looks like in real life. And this is usually what we call polaroid. They contain long chain molecule aligned in one direction, which absorb light wave vibrating parallel to their alignment. So at this point, you might have guessed, what if I were to use two polaroids? The answer is that the light will be completely blocked. So if you look at this wave, the pink color wave get to pass through. But if I were to arrange the second polaroid in this direction, it will be blocked because it's not aligned with the orientation of the Polaroid. So we also call this an analyzer. It's a Polaroid used to detect the direction of polarized would like by allowing only aligned components to pass through, the second one. Now, what if the Polaroid is not arranged either in horizontal or vertical, it's like 45 degree, 30 degree. And that's when we have Mellor's law to help us to identify how much light will pass through. What's the intensity? And the equation to calculate that is I O cos square. So let me explain how this equation work. When the angle is zero, all the light will pass through. But angle is 90, no light will pass through at all. And with that phenomenon, we can actually use a cost graph, which says that when angle is zero, it's one, angle is 90, then it's zero. That's why cos delta is in the equation and everything that is between 0 and 90 have value but in they are in between. So where does the square come from? The square comes from the relationship between amplitude and intensity. So some example here, we have an initial intensity of 120 and then the angle is 30. So if I want the intensity of the transmitted like, all I need to do is just substitute the value into the equation and I would have gotten the intensity of the like. So you can see the intensity decreases if we were to put the polarized at 30 degree. And some application of polarized filter, we have polarized sunglasses, which blocks off certain light, camera lenses, glare reduction in automobiles. Sound wave cannot be polarized because they are longitudinal wave 
and their vibration is parallel to the direction of wave travel so there's no up and down and left and right that's why they cannot be polarized and with that i'm gonna end this long video thank you so much for watching i shall see you again in the next video goodbye